Um, hey, Video Boy's here. Good, excellent. No, we're, uh, we're under, uh, oh, excellent. That's even better. You know, the really cool part about being wireless mic is when you mutter to yourself something insulting about the person over there, it gets blasted to the entire room. Oh, God, what the motherfucker? Oh, Jesus Christ. What happened? Do we want to ask him what happened? Anyway, all right, so we're going to do the thing with that. We got death things there. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So you'll all get a fine amount of time to speak. <laughs> what are we talking about? Fantastic. What are we talking about? Well, today we're talking about what the National Vegetarian Council can do for you. <laughs> you think so? Um, okay. So I guess we're. Is this it? Is this? Is this? Are these thunderous crowds? Okay, thunderous. Can I get thunder, please? Thunder. Thunder. Yeah, the video, the video can't show this, but what we're going to do is we're going to Photoshop in, um, you know, heads, shadowed heads underneath all of this. But I do appreciate all of you coming here, especially during dinner time, which is not an easy time to come here. All right, well, welcome to the Nauticon Hacker Media panel. What this is, and these guys all have their ears pricked wondering what the hell this is, we're just going to go over a quick review of some of the aspects of running a technically oriented media program. All these gentlemen share the same hobby, skill, or profession, which is that they enjoy coming on the air via podcast, via broadcasting, or whatever other method they can find to talk about technical issues. My name is Jason Scott. I'm the moderator. I promise I won't dominate. Let's get an introduction from each person. Your name? Drew. Drew? Yeah. I'm Pony Boy. Pony Boy. Low Tech Mystic. Low Tech. Zach Campbell. Zach Campbell. Slick Zero. Slip Zero. And Droops. Droops. We also call him Nancy Boy, but he prefers Droops. So there you go. All right. So, as I understand it, most of you are on shows. Some of you might primarily be guests. So, in an opportunity to just quickly promote yourselves, if you're on a show, what's your show? Dial a Dork. Dial a Dork. I'm on Belcor Radio. Belcor Radio. Ninja Night School. Ninja Night School. The Packet Sniffers. Packet Sniffers. BaseNet Radio. BaseNet Radio. Twat Radio. Twat Radio. So, um, I guess the first question, of course, is, and any of you can answer this, would be, where did you first get the bug to decide to do a show? Just take the mic, hit the guy who tries to take it from you, and go ahead. Well, actually, I, I started not, not even online. Uh, we were just kind of surfing channels one day and found out that we had a cable access station. And I thought, man, this really sucks. We could, like, do something kind of tech TV on here. And, you know, we were just kind of tossing around names and, you know, all oh, yeah, the screensavers are funny. Ha ha. Oh, well, we could be the packet sniffers. And, uh, well, we just started editing up shows, and then it was uh, about three or four months after that. Then we decided, well, we, we could put it online, too. And then that's when we stumbled into this whole mess. And that's been about it from there. I, uh, I, I probably speaking for most of the other people here too. Uh, I do an internet radio podcast, whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, and I was really just inspired by, uh, mainly by a show called Radio Freak America, which was kind of more or less the inspiration for ninety percent of hacker radio shows that you hear now. And uh, I think that probably most of these people are probably in the same boat as me, but... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there's a show called Radio Freak America, which broadcast from, what was it, was it, two, it was 2002? No, they went for in, into 2000, yeah, 2002 to 2004, I think. Yeah, 2002 to 2004, mostly run by a gentleman named Dual Parallel, who lives somewhere, which you can never figure out, unless you actually listen to the show, and then you know exactly where he lives. Yeah. <laughs> who was blessed with a beautiful voice, and an ability to be interested and astounded at all manner of technical knowledge and act like he was learning just along with you. And he was, in fact, an extremely inspiring person. I had the pleasure of being on his show a few times myself. Um, so, when you put together a show, are there any subjects that you particularly enjoy speaking about that you think your particular brand of show really helps people either learn about or know? Well, uh, I know my show is basically centered generally, not, not all the time, but I try to center it around uh, phone freaking and telephony because there's really not a big 
a, a large amount of uh, shows on that nature that uh, exist still. But um, uh, Ninja Night School is mainly uh, focused around just obscure knowledge. Uh, as hackers in general, we all are. This whole thing to the average person is very obscure. You go to you know tell any kind of like hex or anything like that. You know the average person you just lost them. So uh, also with obscure knowledge, you're not. Okay, we're uh, not just limited to uh, just technical obscure data. There's all kinds of just obscure and interesting things that surround us in our world. So I wanted to give back to the community somehow, and not necessarily being an extremely elite or technical person, I chose to do so by covering other obscure topics that I could bring that I think people in this community would also enjoy knowing about. Well, just like low tech popped out, it's kind of important, especially when you're doing this, not to just oversaturate it with uh, uh, technical content. There's just a lot more things that you can pop the top to and learn what's under the covers. And uh, uh, what I like to do is preserve dying and old technology. You know, if, if you've watched the packet sniffers, you know that I cover Commodore 64 hardware quite a bit. You know, it's kind of a dying thing. The 8-bit generation is kind of fading fast, but there's still a dedicated scene that's still pumping out a lot of stuff new. So it's just one of those obscure, you know, realms that a lot of people aren't, you know, aren't too familiar with or, you know, uh, well, that's about it. <laughs> well, let's see, right now the, the show, BaseNet, does uh, primarily just tech news, but we like to comment on that from kind of a hacker, perspe hacker perspective on it. That's about it. Um, we kind of got fed up with a lot of the uh, podcast shows that are out there that are like, okay, I had this for breakfast, and the other day we went to Best Buy, and my dog's kind of funny looking, and yada, yada, yada. And we said, you know, we should ought to make a show that's just like five, ten minutes long and just has one simple topic or maybe complicated topic, one central theme, and someone just talks about it. And that's what we do. Now, you know, it's funny, because when you bring that up, you're actually mentioning some of the classic podcast slash hacker show, uh, uh, what would be the best word for it? The, the you know, the stereotypical ones. It's kind of funny that people would think that this particular subgenre, which is relatively new, probably only like five or six years of this particular brand, already has its own standards, its own stereotypes, and its own problems, so that you end up with a show in which the person first apologizes for the show not being on for a long time, <laughs> and then starts to argue about what he read on Slashdot today, a lot, and then says, you know, I just bought this item, it was really good. So, you know, are there ways that you find that you try to break out of these? Because certainly you listen to each other's shows and you listen to other shows that aren't made by the people in here. And so, I mean, are there any tricks or ideas that you come up with in your shows to break out of the mold, as it were? Um, yeah. I don't know how things are where you work, but every place I've worked, it's always been that the IT office where the network administrator or the hardware guys hang out is... Um, sort of a, a place where people congregate to find out about computer news and computer knowledge because people are always coming in saying my computer's broken or this is happening in my, on my computer at home and um, that's sort of an interesting unique dynamic to have um, you know the technical and the business people mixing and uh, you know talking about this and that's sort of the model that we've done for our show um, is to try to emulate that IT office um, and try to uh, have a conversation that's sort of like what you would have in, in that kind of office and try to bring the technical information to a, a wider audience. Was that it? Well, actually, uh, that was Lo Low Tech forgot the question. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> but, uh, so just what we do to keep it different uh, what I what mainly what how I try to do my school <laughs> I enjoy trying to emulate things that I've enjoyed and also when you're watching all those audio shows or watching audio shows listening to audio shows all the things that you're like man I wish they would do that why don't they do this and especially things that uh, when I was a little kid and wish man if I ruled the world I would do it like this uh, I kind of bring that into my audio show as well Actually, uh, after something becomes cool, especially when computers suddenly became cool and being a geek or a hacker suddenly became in the spotlight, then suddenly you got the birth of the digital runway. 
So now everybody has sparkly new pieces of technology and they're showing it off. And it becomes more of a social symbol or a, you know, a status symbol than a useful piece of tech that you like because it does something cool or it means something to you. So that's basically what, what we try to bleed through is, you know, just good old fashioned exploration of the world around you, whether it be through technical means or just all around. Uh, we, we try to break, you know, the, the very shallow paper thin facade that is pop technology anymore. We, we try to just, you know, be real about everything. Uh, per uh, not to talk about my show personally, because I think it just kind of fits the mold of basically every hacker radio show you would listen to. But um, are you probably declaring you're 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 being part of the average? Yeah, I I, I can't deny it. Excellent. <laughs> um, but, Embrace the mediocrity. Yeah, uh, but uh, actually, low tech show Ninja Night School. What really make like it's one of my favorite shows to listen to, simply because of uh, it's not just like you know here's this we're going to talk about this and. That's just all it's going to be. He puts a lot of, uh, like, actual plot and, like, acts in his show and has, like, storylines that go in and continue throughout episodes and interesting things like that, which I think is really unique in a... Uh, I've never heard a show that has stuff like that in this kind of genre. But. Okay, well then let's break your skulls open. Certainly in the amount of time that you guys have been doing shows, I know some of you have been doing them for years, some of them less for a few years. Uh, is there some undiscussed fact that you learned doing this? And by that I mean a hint, a way you do a show, a way you approach a show, uh, a way that you get around a problem. Is there something that you as a hint, if you had to say to somebody who was interested in doing a show of their own, that you know they're not going to discover until five, ten shows down the line, that you'd rather they know now and save themselves a lot of pain. Um, make sure you don't encode your shows in really, really, really high files. Make sure you don't your in really, really high files. Yes, Always right. trust your yeah. beautiful microphone thing. There you go. Yes. Uh, the first five or six episodes of Belcore Radio, we were, that was the first time I'd ever touched an audio editing program. And... Uh, we released them and they were like 75 megabytes per like for like an hour long show which i think now we get them down to like 12 so that just made me feel like they were classics yeah. <laughs> it took you a long time to download them so you know they're good like but. i was getting, i was getting the pioneer gold version of your show <laughs> yeah. uh yeah, oh, yeah tap boy well uh there's there's lots of things to tell people like the first thing is most people are only going to do a show less than 10 episodes and a lot of people will get really gung-ho they'll do one they'll be like this is, this is awesome the next one's gonna be so much better I'm gonna buy a website I'm gonna pay for hosting and then seven shows into it they're like this is so much work to try to do this once a week or once a month or get guests on my show and they just give up and find something much more productive to do than this mess and uh, we started a little website, Podcast Fertilizer, or PodcastIncubator.com, I don't even know. And uh, we give free hosting to people who want to start stuff. And that will kind of le lessen the blow when you want to quit, so you don't have all this money invested in things. Um, we've had one guy that got past 10 so far, and that's uh, Low Tech. Yay! <laughs> and then how many people have not made it? They've just quit? Is it four, five, six? Yeah. So. Don't say they quit. Say they completed below expectations. They completed <laughs> below expectations. Um, this real smart guy I was talking to one day told me he had a cool idea, and I've been passing this idea to other people, and there's a guy in the audience over there I passed it to. And he said that do a season. Don't like... The, the way it's been done is they do a season, and it's a year. And what Mr. Jason Scott said was... Uh, do a season which is like 10 episodes and they all tie into each other. And after you record all 10 of them, then you start releasing them once a month or once a week or however you want. And during that time, you can not have to do it and think about your next show so there's more thought put into each show. And then the next season comes around whenever you want it to do and people aren't gonna be you know, forgetting about your show because you're doing it you know, one day and then the next day and then a week later and then a month and a half later and then the next day and that's really, really annoying to ha not have a uh, normal release schedule, but that's the worst part of the whole thing. Our twat radio show is done by, it's a, a make-off of the name of uh, Twit, 
which is the Leo Laporte famous guy podcast. And uh, Mr. Dossman actually helped came up with that name. Hey! But uh, we have multiple hosts that do it, so I don't have to do it every day. In fact, I rarely do one. And we're trying to get so many hosts that you only have to do one every two months, and which kind of takes down on the drudgery of it, and they only have to be five minutes. So sometime during that two months, you're going to say, hey, this is cool, something you learn or something you play with, and then you can do your show. It doesn't have to be about, this is how you secure a Linux box. It can be about all kinds of things. One guy did one on the uh, thought process of something of designing or helping design a, uh, what was it, Zigman throw in some kind of launcher? Yeah, it was a softball. A softball launcher and like the thought press process behind it, which is really interesting. And uh, we have a guy that's in high school that releases them every day because he's the only person that goes home at night to where his parents live and has time to get on the computer for a few minutes and update the site so that most every day there's a new show out and it's about the same time every day. Yeah, I was really stunned. Uh, at one point, I was asked to be interviewed for a show, and I said, that's fine. And I was having the interview occur over Skype, which was already pretty interesting. I know that one person was in Pennsylvania. I think one was in D.C. At some point while we were setting up, one of the kids' moms yelled at him because he wasn't doing his bar mitzvah training. And he convinced mom that he could wait an hour, finish this radio program he was doing, and then start on it. And one, per and I was like, so how old are you? <laughs> Like one was 12, one was 14, and they were interviewing me. I'm in my 30s. And so they were, whereas most kids would be quite happy about the fact that they were able to press play and record on something and yell into it for a while, <laughs> they were quite happy to be doing this interview with a you know, website owner across the country using Skype. So there was this uh, sense of youth that's a little unusual, unsettling. Now, I don't know the variance in your ages. We'll just do this very quickly. I don't think any of you in your teens anymore, right? Okay, yeah, you're safe from droops. Anybody in the <coughs> 20s? No, you're in your 20s. Tony Boy's in his teens. Yeah. Oh, you are in your teens. Okay, you're not 19. safe. <laughs> not safe, totally not safe. Lock your door. And then 20s, we have 20s? And, all right, and 30s? Yeah, so we have this actual, interesting. So, well, interesting to me. So, uh, do you think it's a product of the young, of youth, of time, or is it a case of somebody getting, do you perceive it as more of, this is a brand new thing and I want to be a part of it, or do you case of, after watching this for all this time, I want to jump in? I don't know, I almost would think it would be more of, uh, with the younger crowd, that when you're young, you've got all kinds of stuff to say, and you want to say it, so that might be part of it. I think that I'm kind of the opposite way of him. I think, because there really is, I mean, an even more varying age than what we have here. I mean, there's people in their, you know, middle, uh, like going through their midlife crisis and doing shows like, you know, I, I think uh, I've, I've heard shows, hacker media shows that are people's, you know, up to, you know, 45 or above. I'm not totally sure. But I mean, I think that it really is more just a, it's this kind of this cool new thing to do, you know, I mean, as hackers, we like to share things, and this is a really easy way to share things because, like in a text file, you can't, you know, put emphasis on specific things. But speaking, you can like make sure that people get the point across that you're not, you know, you're not saying something another, and they're taking it another way because you can let them know by the tone of your voice. But uh, okay, yeah. anybody else? I think a lot of it is people genuinely wanting to voice uh, what I feel, what I think, what I want to do. But then as I just brought up, uh, we're, I think it's still relatively new to the point where people are wearing their digital media loafers on the digital runway. And they're just kind of showing them off. So I, I think what we're going to get uh, as, as the strainer of time wears on, we'll, we'll, we'll still have, you know, we'll have more of the genuine stuff. But, but right now I still think that we're kind of in the in the mix for everybody. Oh, this new thing. Oh, you know, they're just kind of showing off right now. So you're saying we're in a show boom that may end up in a show shakeout. That's your opinion? Yes. Okay. Well, I think as far as the whole show boom goes, it's the people who want to do it will continue doing it. Um, while the people who are just in it for, like, just because they know they can and just to the glory and the just money. to get it out there, they 
they, as we were saying before, only do like four or five episodes, two, three. But once you get past maybe about 15, 20 or so, um, it seems like it's going to continue on, especially if it's a weekly thing. Uh, actually, advice I would give if you're interested in starting is to do a few, maybe about anywhere from five to like around five episodes before releasing any, which was uh, an idea Troops was talking about. And maybe not even release those episodes because maybe you don't have a format down for your show yet. And then continue on at whatever episode and call that episode one. That yeah, that's a really good idea. Because the first. Uh, Sorry. The first few episodes of everyone's show are very. I'm learning how to use Audacity. And, you know, the sound quality is horrible and they haven't figured everything out. So that's actually a really good idea. As I recall, Droops, actually, one of your, your, one of your first shows was like 90 minutes. Something like that. There was something where you achieved a show that was like a mini series. I think it's the one that you got drunk in the middle of. Yeah, there were. Um, I used to do a different show that was supposed to be uh, the Droops radio show. Yeah. And that was really a dumb idea, like this bad name. So we came up with this name called Infonomicon. And I couldn't do the show one day, and I asked this guy to help out. And then he and I started doing the show, and we had really good little banter between us. And then we just started getting drunk a lot. And then I had a roommate last summer, and he and I just, that's what we did. And yeah. it, was oh, it was very bad. It was I don't recommend was, anyone I, listening I, to it. I loved listening to it. I transcribed them. Yeah. <laughs> They were fantastic because you actually took a whiz break during it <laughs> outside in your front yard. And it, re it really brought in that sense of community. Because <laughs> you were sharing your whiz with us and with apparently all of your neighbors. Anyway, another piece of advice I just remembered recently um, is since I do this out of a studio, I have somewhat pro gear. And... Um, when an XLR cable does not work, cut it and throw it out. <laughs> That's what I learned, and it, it hasn't failed me yet. That's cable cop, twenty dollars. I have to agree that um, uh, one good way to keep your podcast going is to use alcohol. Um, because, you know, if that's the day when you sit down and have a couple beers, that, you know, really helps you uh, stay with it. One other thing that we do is we have about 12 or 13 people involved in our podcast, and we have one guy that's the MC. He's there every week, but, um, you know, then the cast is pretty much rotating. So if you don't feel like doing it one week, you just blow it off, and it doesn't matter because, you know, there's a whole roster of people that, that are available. Uh, I think it's also more interesting for the listeners because it's, you know, usually not the same combination of people more than once in a row. Right. Now, your show is actually the only one on the panel that's actually been broadcast. Yes, that's correct. We had a little bit of a unique um, beginning to our show. We started it as a radio program, and um, uh, we just uh, patched a, an AM radio into an uh, IceCast server, and we streamed it on the Internet in uh, real time as we did the broadcast, and then we would archive that as an mp3 and put it on the website um, and then we figured that we were just an RSS file away from a podcast so we go ahead and do that um, and over time we just decided to drop the, the conventional broadcast and do the podcast only. Did you find any kind of market difference between working uh, for a broadcast environment versus your podcast? Did your show change significantly? Um, not at first. It took a while for us to, um, you know, get the hang of doing it in a different format, uh, but it's certainly more laid back. We don't have uh, time constraints. We don't have to take breaks at certain points in the show. Um, on the air, uh, we took a lot of calls from uh, people calling in, um, and that was obviously a lot harder uh, with the podcast, so that, that uh, part of it went away. Um, but to compensate for that, we came up with uh, sort of weekly features that we wanted to do. And so we have like this menu of weekly features. And just like the uh, contributors, those vary from week to week too. Um, maybe we have 15 different topics that we'll talk about, but we'll only get to three or four or five of them in a given podcast. Um, so, you know, one of the things that one would think would be markedly different between broadcasting and with that would be the discipline. Do you miss the discipline? Um, maybe the listeners do. Um, but it's, it's actually, it's easier for us. It's uh, more laid back uh, to, you know, not have any of those constraints. So do you guys think that the show is done for yourself or for your listeners? Um, 
like I said before, we try to um, reproduce that uh, atmosphere of the IT office in a medium-sized organization. Um, so we really do it for ourselves um, and for the people that we think would enjoy that type of thing. And, um, you know, uh, the listeners just, um, you know, we get feedback from the listeners. They say they enjoy it. So I don't know if it's a self-selection problem, but the audience we have seems to enjoy the, the format we have. How about the rest of you? Do you think that you primarily do it for yourself to give yourself a voice, or do you do it because you think that there's this gap that these people that you haven't met need to have from you? I, I think, and kind of in the same way as him, I think it's a little bit of both, like a combination work. I mean, I do it for myself because it's a lot of fun, and I like to, you know, be able to just talk about whatever the hell I want and you just really do whatever I want, and people will possibly enjoy it. But, uh, I also think that it is kind of, I, I mean, I do, I started my show because I felt that it was important to talk about things like, like I said, like about phone freaking, because there really wasn't, when I started the show, there wasn't a big uh, outlet for this kind of information, and I found out that that was because there's not really a lot of news that happens, like, weekly in this kind of, uh, this kind of field, and so uh, it, it's kind of gone down from the uh, telecommunications talk from there, but I think it, it is kind of both for for me to have some fun hobby to do and then for other people to uh to be able to enjoy but anybody else have an answer different than that my show is done totally for me i do it because i enjoy it like almost nothing else and the day that that changes is will be the day that i no longer do any more ninja night school I enjoy just running around the house, driving around in my car. I'm making all kinds of noises. I'm talking to myself. I have a blast. I live in my own little world. So I figured why not uh, record a little bit and then I can actually layer in extra sound effects and I can in, you know, increase the you know, spontaneous and wonderfulness of my own little world. And uh, I can share my little world with you guys. And the fact that there's actually people out there who download it and enjoy it, that blows my mind and humbles me more than anything else. So. Uh, you know, it's it's really just for me, and I enjoy doing it because it's fun. So, and the fact that people download it and enjoy it is just uh, that's the cherry on top. Well, uh, I I kind of had that whole speech under the table here, and he just read it and took it. Uh, actually, I if if anybody's seen the Hodgepods that is our show, it's anything and everything that interests us that we have a lot of fun to do. Yeah, you know, that we have a lot of fun doing. The spontaneity of it is pretty much just how our everyday life is. What we do, what we do, what we take apart, what we build, and the fact that you know there's other people that are totally into it and actually take the time to respond to us and uh, keep egging us on really really adds a little extra something to the sh to the show. But we're we're not a catering service, so you know if there's something that people want to see, well, then do your own thing. Well, let's see. The, um, on my show, it's pretty much for us, but it's also to get ourselves in a position where we have to converse about the certain topics, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's not just me; it's also Silent Slade, Morbid, D Mad, and we we also have a couple other people that we could call. And it's really for us about the sharing of information. And we put it out there because we feel others may be interested. And it turns out that they are. Yeah, don't smile. Um, when RFA ended, there was a, uh, a gap. And uh, I was going back listening to a bunch of them, missing the days of the show. And I said, well, I, I could do this. And I started it just to see if I could. and. It, became immense fun and we continued the show until it was no longer fun and then we stopped and with the uh, the twat radio Dossman and I were on the phone or somewhere we were talking about it and uh, we were talking wouldn't it be cool if we just had a show that didn't have all this crap and it came out every day and we learned something new and we started it because we didn't figure anyone else would and the first few shows were us and I intentionally recorded them horribly so it was very crappy and the kids at dig we're making fun of us because of our sound quality. And I have some good stuff. I can make it sound really nice, but we didn't want it to sound too good because then people would be more concerned about the audio quality and say, no, I couldn't do that than the content of the shows. And that's our goal. And it's mainly so I can get a show every day and learn something without actually having to do anything. But anyway, it works out. And you've learned quite a bit. And I have. Um, okay, we're going to open up the questions from the audience because, you know, obviously we want to know where you want us to go with this. Does anyone have any questions for the panel or for me? Yes, sir. So, the name Twat. The name Twat. <laughs> I understand the play on Twitter. Do 
you have you have if you experienced any resistance problems with the movement like that? Other than I noticed because I actually just got it through iTunes yeah. Thursday and it's T uh, T Star Tart right? They take out the W and the A from it. Oh, do they? Yeah. That's, um, that's pretty hardcore. Steve Jobs is scared of you. <laughs> we will not speak of it. it. It does stand for talk with a techie. Right. There you go. Or does it? <laughs> <laughs> Mainly we were just trying to come up with something that was like theirs to kind of poke fun at them. And that was the only word we could come up with. Well, I, I figured that, but I yeah. what kind of... Oh, um, well, besides, besides, of course, the crackdown by Apple... Well, we get a, a lot of crap other than the Apple muscling around. Um, people are all the time complaining about it. The, the audio quality is crappy. You don't have Kevin Rose on the show. Why would you call it this? Are you just, are you just using twit to make yourself famous. Do you think people are going to mistype twit and get twat? It's like, no. <laughs> and uh, I've actually gone through the internet and you know, searched but the, for this crap. And but, take, but the third sorry. or the fourth show, they usually catch on. Yeah. If you're going to be complaining about stuff like that, we probably don't want you to listen to the show because I don't like whiny people and I don't want to have to deal with them. What's up? Are you getting into this? Yeah. Um. What's that? I know there's a lot of women who would slap me if I said that word. Yeah, it's a... Yeah, yeah that, would, that would actually be a function of the maleness of right. a lot of the hacker shows. There are not many female hacker radio <coughs> show producers. It just just works out that way, and I'm sure if there were more, they would be listened to. One of the things that uh, kind of struck me as I was listening to Twit was um, uh, the way Leo Laporte and some of those folks uh, enjoy you know, getting together and talking about stuff. And uh, I think Droops had kind of the same idea at the same time. Was it'd be nice to get some of us to, uh, doing conversing on a, a regular basis, um, talking about some technology and stuff, and having a regular program like. You know, sort of the uh, well-organized folks uh, do on that side of the house. And, you know. Well, they pay their people to be on the show. Oh, really? Or they buy them equipment, things like that. Okay. There, there's monetary yeah. reasons for them to get people. I wasn't aware of any of that. Yeah. So. Okay. The money. I've noticed they've, they've gone, uh, they've kind of gone sellout, too, because the last security now had Twitter and Twitter and Twitter and tons of, of ads sponsored by. And well, I don't think any of us... That, that, oh. that is worth noting. I mean, how many of What's you, that? if somebody came to you and What's said, hey, we're doing oh, guerrilla marketing, how about if you guys give us some ads? You don't mind that, do you? What would be your response? Oh. I'll hit all oh, of you. Yeah. Go ahead. Say, say that you get this, com you know, say NVIDIA goes to you and says, look, we just want this 15-second spot before your show. We'll, we'll even record it professionally for you and give it to you with your show name. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I don't think, I don't see a point of it, you know? I mean, I think that it's like, we're, I mean, I guess if you want to make money, that's cool, but generally speaking, hacker radio stuff is just like, hey, we went and got, you know, Audacity, which is this free audio editing program, and we're just going to kind of make this thing and give it away. But um, I actually wanted to, uh, to respond to his question a little bit about uh, whether there's been negative aspects from the, the name Twat. We actually have a... Uh, one of the guys who helps us run the whole thing, uh, he actually put on his resume or an application for getting a job at an ISP that uh, he's an engineer on TWAT. <laughs> and they were like, okay, so what's that? And it actually helped him get a job. So We usually use uh, TWA Tech. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Transwestern there's, there's Airline. Yeah, TWAT Tech. Yeah. Well, well, let's see. If NVIDIA asked me to, to sponsor maybe a 15 second thing on my show, mm -hmm. I would have to say that maybe if you put accelerated graphic drivers on uh, <laughs> the, l so I could run them on Linux on my Apple PowerBook, maybe I'll mention you for five seconds. I, mean, I, I wouldn't do anything. It would just be part of news that, hey, they came out with this, finally. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, the second you have advertisers, you're going to have to do what they say. And then when you're doing what someone that's paying you says, it's a job. And this isn't a job. Uh, yeah, it's an I, adventure. I come to the same conclusion that once it becomes my job, it is no longer my passion. Therefore, I cannot put my heart into it. And I'm not going to make anything creative anymore. But on the other coin, if the residuals are going to enable me to quit my job, ride a Shetland pony, and eat jello all day long, 
<laughs> and by golly, I'm going to do it, and I'm sorry. Never, never discount the power of the pony jello. I, I most likely, the money would be extra coming from whoever the sponsor may be. So if I'm suddenly not doing what they want me to, then, okay, stop paying me. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Yeah. I was actually rather surprised that Duel didn't get picked up by G4 or something. Because <laughs> he certainly had the talent. Now, it's worth noting the Digital Dog Pound because what you have there is this site, Digital Dog Pound, which is a forum and a um, wiki and a number of other resources that people started to work together on. And I know that when I observed it, that a lot of times people would be driven into doing shows because others would make comments and then put them up and say, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And well, you know, it has its ups and downs, its politics and its wonder. But, uh, you know, did you find a community? Did the community have any peace with uh, you doing this or was it just pure listening to the shows and then you found the community? Uh, I, mine was purely, I listened to a lot of stuff and I was like, I like this, but then most of the shows I really enjoyed just kind of went away for one reason or another. And so it was just kind of like, I need something that will help me fill this gap. So I need to make something, and it, it doubles up uh, because it's some, I can talk about whatever interests me as opposed to what interests just those people. So I, I, I found it to be just kind of like, I didn't know about this whole underground hacker radio community or whatever until I actually kind of got into the, uh, got into this, the doing my own show and stuff. Um, mine was definitely community based. I enjoy all the shows that are out there. I am an idiot. So I, all my knowledge basically comes from what everybody else decides to put together and say, hey, look what I can do. This is how you can do it too. And that, that moves me really more than uh, most things should. Uh, I really get touched uh, by that, probably more than I should. But uh, that's def definitely what drove me. I wanted to give back to the community. And since I'm an idiot and I have no technical knowledge, I figured that there's a lack of uh, a lot of quote unquote entertainment out there in the podcast. Uh, back in the 30s and 40s, there was a lot of radio dramas, you know, radio dramas everywhere. And so many sound effects. And, you know, you close your eyes and you sit back, you were there. You know, you're just a shadow. What lurks in the heart of men? You know, it. You were sucked in, and there's none of that out there. So uh, I'm kind of slowly incorporating that into my show as I get better and better at it. And right now, my show is kind of like uh, it's kind of like Captain Kangaroo, Mr. Rogers, with a little hacker mixed in and some ninjas. So it's, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, definitely very humorous. It's all about fun and mildly serious, but always lighthearted. So. Nothing is leader than Mr. Rogers and Ninjas. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to point that out. That's what makes this show great. Trolley is now controlled by Wi-Fi. Well, actually, when he was talking about 30s and 40s radio serials, I, I was really thinking about the shadow. I wasn't thinking about like the little Orphan Annie uh, serial or anything. No. no, sorry. Nobody listens to radio serials anymore. Never mind. Um, you keep raising your hand. What would you like to ask? same time, I mean, it would just be for like a limited number of episodes and they in no way you know, enforce, you know, what they wouldn't stop you and if they tried to, then you could just... Uh, all that I personally would offer them is a very... Uh, I'd offer them an in-depth look at their product. If they're going to give me money, they're going to give me product, and I'm going to review it and show people something cool that they can do with it. Now, if it's a crappy product, they're going to get a crappy review. They're not buying my, you know, they're not, they're, they're not buying my opinion in any sort. At the same time, I mean, it's not your job. Well, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it as a contract basis. They're, they're basically, I'm, I would be contracting my services to them, but. You know, the, so basically I wouldn't be hired under them. Um, if I really didn't like it that much, then they can go somewhere else. But if they would like to be shown on the show and uh, really have their product shown in a realistic aspect, if they'd really want me to show everybody exactly what they have to offer, then that's what 
then that's what they'll get. And if they don't, then they can walk and uh, you know, pitch it to another fanboy that'll sing their praises for some cash. Uh, I think my answer might be a little different because of all of us up here, I think uh, our show is probably the one that would take the money. Um, we do it for fun. We do it anyway. Uh, we've been doing it for over a year without any sponsorship. Um, but if somebody wanted to give us money uh, for a spot on the show, I think we'd take it uh, because that, that's, you know, that's a nice bonus. Uh, it'll pay for beer uh, or whatever during the show. Um, I think a more interesting question is not so much NVIDIA or uh, someone else like that, but what if it was you know, Sony around the time they came out with their root kit? You know, um, probably all of us talked about that on, on our shows and you know, had our harsh opinions of Sony. Uh, you know, what would you do if someone like that wanted to give you money? And would that impact you know, your coverage? I think it has to because you know, if they're giving you money, then they're going to expect you not to say bad things about them. So that would be a, a tougher call. That's, that's, that's kind of the same. I don't want to take money and be contracted by someone if I'm going to find out later that their product sucks or that uh, just because that, that would keep me from being able to honestly say what I feel about a specific product. And I mean, I, in my opinion, like if, if you're getting paid to do your hobby, that's, that, I mean, that, that is when you've sold out, in my opinion. I mean, no offense to, you know, if, but I mean. <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, the, seat, the seating's great. Yeah, so Rick is a sellout, and uh, everyone, yeah, everyone must stone him later. That's fantastic. The idea is to engage and embrace your audience and make them feel at one with you. Except, that guy. Except for that guy. I get it. So the key is really to build and embrace the audience by attacking another member of the audience. All right, I'm just learning. Learning the pony boy way in five steps. <laughs> Step one, find an enemy. <laughs> Go ahead. Any, oh, there was any? Okay, yep, we're all on the up, down, sell out. Excellent. Um, okay. Are there any other questions from the audience? Don't want anyone to feel locked up. Oh, look at them all. See, we've stunned them into happiness. <laughs> the, the pure wattage of hacker media power up here is very interesting. By the way, I can say that as somebody who has been approached by advertisers for textfiles.com and a couple of my other sites. I generally unequivocally tell them to fuck off directly, uh, usually with a huge stream of profanity and linking them to an essay about why I don't take advertising. Half the time they don't respond. The other half they proceed to explain to me why I'm an idiot. So, I mean, I've seen that realistically happen and a lot of that, from my point of view, is just simply from the point of view of that, first of all, in my case, it opens up liability because I am in some way selling the products, none of which are really mine. And the other reason is that I find more often than not, it's simply because they haven't found the methamphetamine ingredients. <laughs> so once they do, they're going to be very angry at me and they're going to tell me that I wasn't what I claimed I was by being me and not do it. And like I said, more than once I've been lectured to by somebody who makes money saying, dude, welcome to the real world where we do this. In fact, Believe it or not, I was actually pursued by someone about the BBS documentary about dramatizing it and selling a script based on it. Not unlike the Dogtown Z-Boys movie that came out that was a documentary and then became Boys of Dogtown. Same idea. Boy, would that have been a bad movie. But I also told him very bad things, and he was very angry. So anyway, that kind of actual thing, because a lot of times people hear this stuff and they'll say, well, these are relatively small audiences. Who would go for them? And the answer is, you'd be surprised especially in today's fragmented world, that yesterday's hacker media show is tomorrow's possible new slot on G4. And that in a move desperation, they'll say, let's do up all night. Let's try to do something like the Adult Swim guys. Let's just get anyone we can to go into the two to five slot hour and, and take a risk. And so these questions actually do come up to you over time. Anyway, all right, so there's no questions there. Now, oh, we have, we, I know you had one, oh, look, oh, bumpies. Okay, yep, what? Most difficult challenge of your show? Uh, for me, personally, the most difficult challenge initially was uh, hosting. Finding a place to put the show. Because we started out, a friend of mine was like, yeah, sure, I'll host your show on my, my server or whatever. Not expecting you know, anything big to come out of it. And 
like the first few episodes, we got a lot of downloads and ran his bandwidth out. And uh, so he was like, yeah, I know I told you I'd host it for free and everything, but I'm not, and you have to pay me now. I'm not going to host it, and you have to pay me for everything you just used up. Yeah. Let's, so, let's see also the 75 meg per show download. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's <laughs> basically. But uh, I guess if you, have, if you, if you catch on to the smaller, uh, smaller file size, it won't be such an issue. But uh, finding... Yeah. yeah, I still, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I still haven't paid him for it, but yeah, he's, I still talk to him, so. Um, I know my biggest challenge is just uh, the real world, seeing as how most of the time I spend in uh, my own personal world, which is much funner than y'all's. Uh, uh, yeah, just, you know, trying to find the time between work and, you know, all the other stuff that you've got to do to actually live and continue living, uh, finding time to sit down and do all the silly stuff that I do. Uh, well, actually, one of the things that I uh, that I had to struggle with, uh, which I, I still I still contend with, is stage fright, camera shy, things of that nature. So actually, if if you watch the progression of our shows, I more and more warm up to the camera. So actually, it's been very therapeutic for me, and I've I've had a pretty good time. Also, you know, negative press is not good for anybody, even if you're doing a project for yourself. And we we got a little bit of that, and you know what. Uh, a, a very drunken uncle of mine from southern Indiana wearing a mullet and told me, gave me a really good bit of advice and that's uh, hold your head up and keep on trucking. And, and you know, it, it holds true actually, sadly. And then we sang Billy Ray Cyrus. That's, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of knowledge that you can take with you through your whole life. Everything works that way. Anyway, let's see. The biggest challenge for my show had to be uh, a in, it involved hosting, as Ponyboy mentioned, but it also involved, uh, let's see, a DOS and a $2,600 bill, something like that, which was never paid and I never heard much more from it, so it was probably, a, the, the hosting company was probably a scam. Don't use Kanaka. Um, it's really hard to get somebody together, like we are talking earlier, unless you're paying them. You know, be here at this time, and it's really hard to get two or three people, or some people try like five people, and that doesn't work out at all. And uh, involving that, the seriously hard thing we've had is content, is you want to have something that's interesting. And the number of listeners matters to a lot of things, but it really doesn't at all if you're just doing a bad job. So content is the number one thing. We, we don't have trouble, per se, but just what we work with. The first person ever. That man right there. If we have any tickets, well, give it to him, please. One agreement. agreement. Will someone second them off? Like, no. uh, <laughs> you know, well, I've noticed like shows like Off the Hook has just turned into psycho babble ranting about politics, and, and yeah. you know what? We want content. We don't want just bullshit. People screw around and talk about politics all day long. And, politics and if you want that, you so, know where to go get it. So, so you're saying Off the Hook has lost the fan. Kind of on the on the same on the same line of thought. Uh, personal <laughs> challenge, I think, for for myself and Zach is uh, the show doing video takes so much time and effort that I found the last two years I've done a lot fewer personal projects like we've had on the show just because it takes so much effort to do the show, and that's one thing that that's the challenge. And um, the last. Three or four months has been good for the project we've been working on uh, that's upstairs. Uh, just to focus on doing, having some fun doing a cool project rather than trying to specifically film it and create it as content. So I think you kind of have to, for me, I have to go back and forth and do some fun projects and stuff and then bring it back to, to film it or something. Do you have a question? Let's, let's just get him one. That was just actually my question leads into it. Would any of you others, I think other of you consider doing video? Yeah, I've done some. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I plan on recording some and submitting some to Hack uh, TV Underground. So, uh, Me and a few of my friends at a, at a local 2600-ish type meeting that I run uh, decided one day that that's what we're going to do. And we were going to make the best damn, you know, internet TV show there was. And uh, that was about a year ago. And uh, we've done about as far as drawing a storyboard for it. 
because I mean it, it's really not for everyone. I mean, it took me forever to master audio editing and to get good at it at least. And uh, I don't know, video is just that it's it's a an alien technology to me. I'll you know it's I, I can I have a hard enough time you know making sure I have the right you know codec and downloaded and installed or whatever to watch some videos online or whatever. <laughs> but I don't know, it's that that's a technology that I don't really see myself being able to uh, get into uh, decently at least. But, um, okay, the, you two are the last question. Go ahead. Okay, I have kind of a question wrapped in a comment. Like you guys in an enigma? G4 TV, like as in the like, commercial known media center for all these technological shows. And you're all on Hacker Media, pretty much? Yeah, HackerMedia.org is Hacker the Media website Network. to find out everything. Mm -hmm. And I know that Droops has already started SWAT, which is like randomly having different hosts do the same thing. Have you ever considered taking like all the different members from a hacker media thing and kind of creating like your own sub network, or do you think hacker media already is like an internet version of like G4? Oh, you, um, yeah, I have to really point out that Troops has been uh, quite you know, you, you basically you have two people who have been doing a lot of uh, spearheading organization, and that would be Stank Dog. Uh, the Digital Dog Pound, and Droops, who's here. Both of these people turned around and, while they did their shows, also turned around and started to try to build some level of step ladder and say, okay, well, here's a bunch of slots we need you to fill. Put a show here. Put something here. Tell me something here. And if you don't, can't do your own show, do your own show with me. <laughs> Go with here. And let's add this thing. And what else do we need? And so on. And that's not a question. In, in, in any culture, there's only a few people who actually ask that question. A lot of guys want to drive the cars. Not many want to figure out, hey, maybe someone should keep a list of where we get the parts. You know, they want to be, they want to do their little thing, but they don't want to say, okay, how do we work on it? So Droops has definitely done that. Stank Dog has done that. Anyway. Oh, um, shoot, I forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> I do that. It's yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The Jason Scott memory ray. Ooh. Um, I don't think we have a broad enough audience to do that and have our own little media thing like that. I, I really consider Hacker Media to be the central location because everyone that I find that's doing a show and I say, hey, here's an account on Hacker Media, post your stuff so we have some content. And everyone's like, wow, oh yeah, heck yeah, we'll, we'll put it on there. And hopefully we give them a bunch of hits. We've had uh, 20,000 hits on the site in the last five days. But that's with the RSS feed every time someone boots up their computer or iTunes wants to check or some website wants to hit it. So it's really, really hard with our crappy one and one stuff, don't use one and one to determine what those are all for. I mean, it's a good number, but we don't know what it is. And like, um, Infonomicon Radio stopped like a year ago. I don't know, maybe half a year ago. And we still get like 2,000 hits on the RSS feed every uh, week. And that's just people have looked at it and said, oh, this is cool, and never removed it. And every time their podcast or client it runs, we still get hits. Mm. So it's really hard to judge what we have. So we have a really smaller audience than 20,000 hits a, uh, in the last we, five days. We also had that great experiment known as Freak Factor. It's one of the finest ideas I've ever oh, yeah. heard of. <laughs> oh, yeah. How many people here, anybody here, who here is familiar with Freak Factor? One, two, three. Uh. Freak Factor was an experiment. Now, it was a very interesting experiment. The idea was, let's set up a conference with absolutely no moderation. Let's record it for two hours. Surely something must good must come of this. Uh, I, this Freak Factor is, uh, and I was actually hoping this would get brought up, but because uh, I love to talk about Freak Factor. It was the best and worst idea ever. Um, Freak Factor was really cool because it was like, let's get all these people, and we're running out of time, so I'll make it quick. Let's no, no, she was saying, you suck. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it was basically, you have all these people, and they're just talking about anything they want. There's, I mean, just completely free-flowing thought. Like, there's no, no kind of mediation behind it, no kind of specific thing. It's just whatever people are interested in right then and there. Calling yeah, but it turned into the first episode, they were kind of like, well, we don't know what to do, so let's make prank phone calls. And so then every episode, I think they only did like 12 episodes, Yeah. and they were each actually about four hours long. Uh, each episode ended up being about two hours of them trying to get on various Walmart PA systems. <laughs> and once they did, you know, just 
saying stupid shit like dog balls. <laughs> and I mean, it, it was... But, uh, but it's important to know, I mean, within a very short time, you instituted moderation, yeah. you had to kind of sign up to get into the pool and still be an idiot, and so on. Just, and it's like, like you, I agree with you, best and worst, because yeah. what came out of there was totally magical yeah. or a horror show. Yeah, I, I really think that that's, that's going to be what the next... Like, there's going to be a lot more shows like that coming. I mean, there, there's going to be a lot more shows where it's just like, let's get a bunch of people on here. And there actually are shows that are coming out lately, I've noticed, that they're just like, let's get a bunch of people together and just talk. We'll just, we'll just get together and write them, we'll just talk about whatever. So, but I think you're... Yeah. To me, Freak Factor was a lot more interesting because it was never planned to be recorded. They were just going to stream it live as it happened. It was going to be a reality show and just throw people in there and let them do whatever the hell they wanted. And of course, people record phone, com or foreign phone conferences and then they were trading them around. So they said, okay, let's write a little script that records it. And they recorded it. And everyone's like, this is horrible. We need to fix it. So they said, all right, let's, let's put moderation in. And every week, they did something different on the show, just like behind the scenes to make things different. They tried to get some people to, just random people, okay, you're in charge today. You can kick people off if they're annoying as hell. And that doesn't really work. And it was just interesting to watch them change it to try to, you can't control a phone conference. And especially with people calling in, they just want to prank call Walmart. You can't stop that. And it's just really fun watching all that as it took place. Well, there's something to be said for that. Yeah. Just that. And that was, it was yeah. hyped as the first internet reality show. So if you, if your <laughs> one big takeaway, you know, your one big takeaway, Hacker Media fucks with Walmart. Now let me just get these guys, okay, just give them your URL. Uh, dialadork.com, that's hyphenated, dial-a-dork.com. And yours? Belcorradio.net. Okay, and yours? Ninjanightschool.com. And yours? Packetsniffers.org, or for some laughs, kitchen.org. Oh, yeah, kitchen.org, K-Y-C-H-N. Well, that's just completely intuitive. Go ahead. <laughs> Basenetradio.net. Okay. Uh, Hackermedia.net. Okay. And? TwatTech.org. Okay, so thank you very much for your time tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And thanks to our panelists. So, hey. in this area we're having right here, it's going think? to be a party like it's going out of style with open decks. Then hey, uh, if anyone wants to be a host on Twat, hey, c contact me and Ponyboy. Awesome. Right in there. So once I, I, again, we're going to have open decks here. We're going to have a couple stuff here. The yeah. night's not over. Talks are over, but yeah. the fun is still okay. going on. Hey, shut up for a second, Jason. Uh, I just wanted, before everybody goes, um, over there at Nauticon Radio Station, which we probably could have talked about during this thing, uh, we're actually going to be recording an episode of Belcore Radio that kind of became our lost episode. It disappeared one day. And uh, just so if anybody wants to get on, just come over there. We've got like four mics that we're just kind of pointing at random areas. So if you want to be on a cool show, or hopefully this one will be a cool show, just come over and we'll get you on. You can talk about whatever the hell you want. <laughs>